been asked to come and make predictions about the future of surgery. And that is, after all, my job, so it seems to fit fairly well. But if making predictions about surgery doesn't strike you as funny, then you haven't been paying attention to the long, sad history of expert predictions gone terribly wrong. As the great Yogi Berra quipped, it is tough to make predictions, especially about the future, but it is rather useful at times because history is littered with failed companies from the high-tech space that uh, had one big product, they succeeded well, and then they just disappeared as everything changed around them. Now, I do have one advantage in being able to predict the future of surgery in that uh, I, as Daniel mentioned, I'm director of medical research at Intuitive Surgical, and we make surgical robots. And as you know, you're much better at predicting the future if you're part of making it. I have another advantage when I am trying to predict the future of surgery in that in the long run, when we're looking at any kind of a new technology, we have to look at something that is fundamentally going to improve patient outcomes. Not just curing the disease, but leaving that patient feeling better afterwards, being able to let them get on with their lives. Money is also a driver, as we heard, for good and for bad in the development of any new technology. And one of the things that happens is when we start piling new technologies into any kind of a care, we start adding cost. And unless we can offset the cost that we're adding with savings down the road so that we can make the overall treatment cheaper, we're not going to have uh, any new technology that's just bringing cost is not going to become part of the permanent medical arsenal. Now, I'll give you an example, one that's very, very near and dear to my heart, of uh, minimally invasive surgery using surgical robots. Yes, there is an upfront cost associated with having your robot in, but the downstream savings of the patients being able to go home earlier and not having so many uh, complications more than offsets the cost of the upfront uh, using that technology. And so it's been adopted. And as Daniel said, there's many of them around the world. It's not 18,000, though. It's 1,800. But we are still doing about 200,000 surgeries a year with them. So when I am trying to figure out what future should we be making, what, what technology should we be developing, the biggest thing that I do is I look for a gap. I look for a gap between what we can do for patients right now and what we would like to be able to do for patients, if only. And this is the kind of thing where if we can bring a high-value technology in there, we will be able to improve those patient outcomes. So let me give you an example in lung cancer. Right now, today, if you're diagnosed with lung cancer, you have about a 15% chance of still being alive at the end of five years. Now, if we catch it much, much earlier, we can uh, surgically cure it. We can cut it out, and you have about an 80% chance of surviving to five years. But the biggest problem with being able to detect these cancers early is that every study in the past that was done looking at trying to screen for lung cancer ended up not working out terribly well because we ended up killing or injuring more patients working up the majority of benign nodules that were found than patients were ever saved by finding those cancers early. And so the history of lung cancer has been dogged by having this kind of a problem. Clearly, what we need to do is we need to make diagnostics better and we need to be able to make the surgery less morbid. Now, lung cancer is about to be severely perturbed. Just this past year, and the study came out in the New England Journal of Medicine this summer, they found that if you risk stratify the patients who you're going to screen, you actually do much better. If you take people with a 30-plus pack year smoking history and you screen them with a low-dose CT scan, that's when you get a 20% mortality benefit by being able to uh, screen those patients. Now, 
that's about 17 million patients or people in the, in the United States, which means there'll be about 5 million nodules that need to be worked up and probably about a million of them that need to get taken out at some point. But what that does do is it takes lung cancer, which has mostly been a death sentence, and turns it into something that in this screened population may be surgically curable. So cue the surgical robot. This, not too surprisingly, is one of the fastest growing areas of uh, procedures growth with the da Vinci surgical robot. What we're seeing is that if you use the robot and you do several small incisions rather than one long uh, incision in order to be able to do lung cancer surgery, you dramatically reduce the length of stay, and it turns out you also reduce the costs. So there was a hospital in Kentucky that went over to a fully robotic program for their lung cancer, and they were sending patients home an average of four days earlier. And instead of every single patient needing post-operative ICU care, only about 15% of their patients needed post-operative ICU care. And that was a very big savings for this hospital. They took what was a loss-leading uh, surgery program and turned it into something that was profitable, and it was better for the patients as well. And so this is exactly the kind of problem that we want to be solving with these high-tech medical devices. We want to take something that we're not doing a very good job for the patient. We want to bring the technology in and close that gap. Now, there's going to be a lot of alternate therapies that are offered for this sort of thing. Everything from ablation, you can ablate with high-frequency ultrasound, you could even do radiation, there'll be alternate surgical therapies that are talked about. And there are several people here in the audience and talks in the future that you'll hear about different ways of approaching cancer. And we'll all have learned discussions and we'll bring out our data and it will all be very respectful and we will talk about what's the better therapy. I might win that discussion, but we'll have that discussion at a later point. But all the time, we are just going to be marching down the path to technological obsolescence. Because while we're focusing on the way surgery is done now, we are going to be completely blindsided by the fact that it's going to change entirely. And it's not going to be my competitors, it's going to be my colleagues that upend surgery. My colleagues who are researchers in diagnostics, people who are looking at new ways of, uh, new pharma, new bioinformatics, people who are trying to relook at the other aspects of medicine while I'm so focused in here on surgery. That's going to change lung cancer surgery. Now, there's precedent for this kind of thing happening. Not too many years ago, there was a really reasonable argument that could be had about what was the best way to treat ulcers. Open surgery, laparoscopic surgery, endoscopic surgery, real debates, until an Australian researcher, Barry Marshall, swigged a cultured beaker full of Helicobacter pylori and showed the, the connection between bacterial infection and ulcers. Well, now the surgery discussion is absolutely moot. No one does ulcer surgery. You just take antibiotics. Much, much better value for the patient. And none of the people who were working in the surgery, surgical technologies were really going to be able to predict that. So when I look for disruption, I'm looking out at my colleagues, and there's some of you guys out there that are probably going to completely upend my world. So back to prediction making, since that's what I was supposed to come here for. Did you know that dogs can smell cancer? And I'm not really changing the subject. If you've got cancer in your body, it's in your blood, it's in your saliva, it's in your urine, there are biomarkers that are showing signs of cancer that are just there to be read in lots of the secretions, and fairly, not terribly invasively. So my colleagues who are out there really trying to figure out how they're going to do better diagnostics, lots of really smart people working in that area. So what happens if they succeed? What happens to my world if they succeed? What if we can find every single cancer when it's just the size of a pea. 
Well, then we tell our friends in radiology, we know it's there somewhere, we've detected it, go find it. And we take it out through a very small incision, or more likely the radiologists keep those patients themselves and just stick a needle into it and ablate it. No more big sal salvage surgeries, no more chemo radiation, no more pharma, just like managing moles on sun-exposed skin. We keep an eye on them. When they change, we take them out. This mole theory of cancer is maintenance. Very, very different from the way we're doing it. What if we need to know more about the tumor than we've uh, been able to know up until now? What if to cure it, we can't just ablate it, but we need to sample that tissue? Now we take it out, and we can hand it over to our friends in cancer immunotherapeutics, and they can potentiate the body's immune system against the cancers, and then your body just mops up those cancers afterwards. So again, no more chemotherapy, where we're killing the tumor only slightly faster than we're killing the patient. Instead, your, body has a, your body's immune system has a lot of practice at wiping out the things that it doesn't want while leaving you pretty much intact. So only a little bit of work to do for the surgeons and uh, not a whole lot of work to do for the uh, radiologists. And also because the body's own immune system is wiping out all of these uh, cancers, we're not bringing out any more big blockbuster drugs. The patient is making their own blockbuster drug. It's their immune system. No, there's another future. We don't even have to wait until cancer is the size of a pea. Instead, you can just get infected with specially designed adenoviruses, and what they do is they selectively kill cancer cells. And there's quite a few of these under uh, development right now as well. So we don't wait until it's just as large as a pea. No imaging, just kind of like a cleansing process. You don't need any surgeons. You don't need any radiologists. Your GP is your only doctor. That's right. Viruses are the answer. Except that, no, viruses are the problem. We've been discovering that in almost every cancer generation, there's some step along the way that needs viral involvement. And now there's a whole new class of drugs out there called nanovirucides, and they are nanoparticles that'll kill a virus. Now, it, what if part of our morning routine, we're not taking vitamins anymore, but we're taking our aspirin and our statin, and then we take our nanovirucides, and we get rid of the common cold, we get rid of HIV, we get rid of Ebola, but then we also notice that an entire generation gets to 60 years old with no sign of cancer anywhere in their bodies. It's because we got rid of all of the viruses. No more cancer. This is the problem with making predictions. Now, several of you are kind of shaking your head at my naivete, or you're worried about me because I'm going to be out of a job very soon. But my friends over in regenerative medicine are busy making new body parts. And so as we all try to get to 150 and we try to get there comfortably, I'll build surgical robots just to install those new body parts and keep us all comfortable. But why are we so bad at predicting? Why is it so difficult to be able to say, yes, this is where surgery is going to go? It's because in the near term, it marches along with fairly predictable, spottable trends, and then gets upended into wildly divergent futures because of technologies that are outside of the field that it's in. And I'm going to be particularly blind to this disruption because I simply know too much about what I do. It's exactly the characteristics I have that are good at making me spot trends. I'm an expert. So those learned researchers who were laughing at Marshall about the H. pylori connection now look kind of ridiculous when he wears his uh, Nobel Prize to parties. 
And those uh, businessmen who marched their companies into obsolescence in the tech world and are now subject to the mild pitying contempt of a next generation of business school students, these people were not idiots. They were simply experts who were about to have their worldviews overturned. My daughter's generation is going to ask, when they look at my predictions today, like, oh my god, how did she get it like so totally wrong? <laughs> well, it's because I'm very, very practiced at filtering. I take a huge amount of noise, a huge amount of data, and I filter out everything that I think is relevant to my field, and I discard all of the rest. And I'm highly trained to do that, which means I'm highly trained to miss something that's going to get outside of my filters. No matter how wide I'm casting my net, I can be thinking about nanovirucides under development in Connecticut and thinking about what's that going to do in terms of global disease burden for cancer, and I'm still not casting my net widely enough because I'm still thinking about it in terms of what am I going to do in surgical therapies. So the future is going to end up happening to me, and I will adapt. But what do you do in this situation? Well, in the mean term, in, in the near term, I'm going to continue to look at those trends. I'm going to continue to look for that gap between what we can do for patients right now and what we really want to be able to do for patients. And I'm going to try to fill that gap with appropriate, cost-effective technologies. And I'm not going to underestimate the disruptive effects of my colleagues. And I am going to listen to people younger than me when they tell me I am like, so totally wrong, because I will be, and I am, and I will be consistently wrong, and I will keep making a few more mistakes after that, and the sooner I realize that, the better, because that is going to allow me to adapt quickly. So my final prediction is that the future future of surgical technologies is that we will have much, much better patient outcomes but the technologies and the techniques that we're using will be completely unrecognizable to those of us that are working in the field right now. And we will all be trying to figure out how we didn't see it coming. Thank you.